Hey, everybody. Welcome to Pale in Comparison. In this podcast, my sister uses her knowledge of the other verse to take a look at Pact, Wildbow's least appreciated work, and I try not to give away any spoilers. I'm Jenny, and Malia convinced me to read Worm. I'm Malia, and Jenny convinced me to read everything else. This episode, we are covering Bonds, chapters 1.4 and 1.5. Before we get into that, however, I'd like to issue a spoiler warning. This podcast is filled with pale spoilers. If you don't know who wins the Blue Heron Institute Wars and don't want us to tell you, stop now, read Pale, and come back to this podcast. As for Pact, there will be full spoilers through the chapters that we are covering. All right, well, we'll start with the chapter summary real quick, and then we'll get into it, okay? <laughs> well, a chapter's summary, uh, I should say. Um, <laughs> it's like attorneys general. What was that? Like, it's not attorney generals, it's attorneys general. Because general's an adjective. It's weird. Also, don't call attorneys general generals. They're not generals. They're not commissioned officers. My professor has a whole thing about this. I'm sorry. We can move on. Or like, it's like mothers-in-law. It's not mother-in-laws. What the hell? Sorry. Okay. Chapters summary. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Um, Hopefully some of you can understand that better than I just did. Anyway, Blake and Rose have a discussion about how different their family lives were. Rose tries to pitch him the idea of becoming witch hunters, which he isn't too keen on. They're interrupted by a visit from the cops, including one named Laird, who questions Blake about Molly's murder. One of the officers, who is Laird, seems to know more than meets the eye. They go for a walk and talk about hypothetical politics while heading to a coffee shop. Laird strands him at the shop using time trickery. While heading home, Blake runs into Patrick and his companions. Rose is able to get him out of the situation. Laird shows back up and walks him the rest of the way home. What did you think about these chapters, Malia? They were really exciting. It was fun getting out into Jacob's Bell and meeting people. We got both a nice overview of the town and the town's kind of practitioner politics. And then also a fun other interaction. And Blake didn't die. And Rose helped out. It's good job. Yay! Good job all around, good people. Job. <laughs> all right um so we'll start blake gets out of the shower and has another discussion with rose about how different his life was compared to hers then she helps him shave which was nice mm-hmm. i can't imagine not being able to see myself in a mirror that would be so frustrating <laughs> so it's the right. least she could do sort of <laughs> that's true <laughs> i know she kind of has to awkwardly <laughs> sit there and watch it be like oh <laughs> right so i i the first thing that really popped out to me from this part was um, Rose talks about her relationship with Molly and Paige. And like we sort of alluded to the last episode, they weren't close um, ever, which was really surprising. I didn't think that that's how it would be. I-, I don't really get why. A possibility that I have been thinking about is that maybe there were lots of different possibilities about who Rose could have been, right? Like who Blake could have been if he was a girl. And so maybe grandma was able to choose this particular rose for some reason okay like because presumably girl blake could have been like fuck you family whatever like and had a life a lot more similar to blake's Mm -hmm. but rose is what we have which is you know great because i i like her okay but i'm i'm wondering like what is the desire like what's desirable about rose not being friends with her cousins because she's like, oh, I just don't like the extended family. Which makes sense because, like, they targeted her by pouring a bunch of orange juice concentrate in her car when, like, I couldn't understand what was going on. Like, why did Irene being an ass to Paige, like, involve Rose? I didn't understand that at all. There's a note about how Rose was presumably given a car, whereas Blake had to buy his own vehicle. But I don't, I'm, I'm curious as to why that's a thing. Sorry, that was really... It's it, got to get no, back. No, no, it's okay. Podcasting brain, and a big a big question that I currently have is how does the bad karma that sits with this family pass on from generation to generation? Now that Blake and Rose have it, or is their extended family like free of it? It seems like that would be eventually be very diffuse if like they all had a little piece of it. So maybe it like concentrates with the next practitioner. So like is Mm -hmm. Paige off the hook now like are they gonna just like fucking chill like are our grandparents 
or great grandparents or something had land in like Nebraska or something. And great grandparents because my dad's generation they were like oh let's we we need to just sell this land now because there's already like whatever like 15 people involved and then if it goes to our children there's going to be like you know 40 billion people involved and that's too many people (laughs) um (laughs) we have a lot of but like cousins (laughs) right but in this situation it could be useful to be like let's spread the shittiness out like yeah so i'm just like I was feeling like um, at the funeral and stuff, like, I feel like Blake and Molly and all of them, they noticed the bad karma kind of towards their family, mm-hmm. even though they weren't practitioners. Mm-hmm. Do you think that was just like because they were near Grandma Rose at the time? Or do you think they still get a little teeny bit of that bad karma? Or like, I don't know. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Well, it does seem concentrated in Jacob's Bell because Molly was the one that pointed out, oh, everyone here hates us. Whereas, like, Blake seemed to be doing okay Mm -hmm. where he was earlier. I don't know why that's a thing. Okay. No, that's interesting. It's interesting to think about. So you talk about, in your notes here, great-grandpa the robber baron. Yeah, I was a bit confused as to, was this Grandma Rose's father, who she, like, revered, who I thought was a practitioner because she was like, he's great? Or was it her stepfather? Because, like, Grandma's mom was a widow, and I don't know if that was important uh i was like maybe she hadn't picked a useful spouse and got rid of him and got this like robber bear man i don't know yeah maybe their family tree yeah <laughs> i mean yeah it's just kind of interesting that rose didn't hear about him right dun dun rose didn't seem to know much about like she didn't talk to <laughs> the people in her family like blake was like yeah like the mm. murder and she was like what true so you think it's just because they weren't close enough to talk about all that stuff that she just didn't know or maybe I wish you guys could see her facial expression right now because it was truly beautiful. Uh, uh, don't know what it means, but it was wonderful. And then, and then something that Rose said confused me. I think Rose said it. She said like others were liars. She like accused others of like being liars, and like li- others can be very deceitful. But I was kind of like, no, others can't lie because the ramifications of the whatever. Except like. I thought maybe it was like the seal of Solomon or whatever that like made them not lie. And then I got real confused because like maybe with practitioners, the practice just like ignores them until they make certain promises and then starts paying attention to their words. But it seems like others can't lie. But then like, isn't Rose sort of maybe another and like she can probably lie. Like, do others just like form into being (laughs) knowing they can't lie? It doesn't look like Rose said that. It looks like it was one of Blake's thoughts as he was, like, brushing his teeth or whatever. Oh, my bad. Like, Snowdrop... Well, Snowdrop, like, has to lie. Like, you know, like... But Snowdrop is still bound by that rule of discourse. And, like, Tashlet, like, I think can't lie. But Tashlet isn't... Like, and, like, Composite Kid and all these people... Like, all these fucking people that just, like, like, come into existence. Like... I believe can't lie. If they can, somebody should tell the Kenneteers. But uh, how do they know that they can't? There's also the Snowdrop familiar ceremony just happened. And there was a lot of conversation in that chapter about not wanting to like use like bind Snowdrop to the seal, I think is what was going on. Yeah. But like, isn't she already slash? uh, I don't know. I'm I'm confused, y'all. This this whole section is just me being like, I don't know what the practice is. Um, <laughs> like this, these two chapters, I'm just like, oh, I don't get it. Well, I mean, it it is pretty complicated. So feel free to put your clarifying responses in our discussion thread or in Discord. Yes, please. Or email it to us. How obvious it all is. <laughs> but yeah, use pale specific information, please. <laughs> Oh, yes. If you use packed specific information, please spoiler it. I'd be saying yes. But yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure that all has to do with the Seal of Solomon. So I should go back and read that section where they talk about it, wherever yeah. that was. I probably should, too, to be honest. But interesting, though. Mm-hmm. So. All right. So basically, Rose tries to convince Blake that they should become witch hunters. Blake's not really too hot on the idea. 
Yeah, so point two for me. When the the strike three is gonna be like confirmed, they're witch hunters, and I'm gonna be right. Like the like you know things in threes in the practice. So the third time it's the word witch hunters is used, it's gonna be like yes, Malia, you were right. <laughs> um, the other thing is so. I was pretty sure in Pale that witch hunters are not awakened, awoke, awokened, Mm -hmm. but they are aware. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, so if Blake and or Rose has to go through the awakening ritual, could they become witch hunters? Like, is that allowed? That's a good question. Also, Rose, like, I love you, but stop being such a coward. A weak (laughs) familiar... And a small domain are like the worst fucking ideas I've ever heard. And she doesn't get it. But I'm like, no, don't make yourself weaker by tying yourself to something lame. And don't like constrain Mm -hmm. yourself in this tiny little box. I feel like a non-threatening implement could be okay. But like, don't do a rock. That The man in the textbook (laughs) was really adamant about not doing a rock. She didn't say a rock. So maybe like a non-threatening implement would be okay. What if it's like a paperweight? That's not really a rock, but like... (laughs) You know, <laughs> like a pretty rock. <laughs> what if it's like one of those decorative rocks that's like all polished and nice, you know? Yeah, I think the guy was a little harsh on rocks. Kind of random, but on Reddit, sometimes they have like these. It's been a little while since they've had them, but I'm blanking out what they're called. But it's kind of like um, in universe, like people acting like they're practitioners posting like, oh, cute, on, like a thread, you know? And I remember there was one that was like this guy defending stone implements (laughs) and it was really great yes (laughs) it was kind of amazing someone should send that to us because i'd be so happy like little like rock pet yay yay anyway (laughs) blake at some point mentions that he shouldn't leave the house because the house reborn some provides some protection Uh and then he leaves immediately thereafter ah yes (laughs) uh yeah but i don't remember if that was before the cops show up or after so that was after the cops show up oh my bad no it's okay (laughs) but that that is true um yeah so but because basically right after this two cops show up and question blake about molly one of the cops laird um invites blake for a walk and they talk about hypothetical world politics the details about molly's murder continue to get worse and like it's so horrible. It's so yeah. horrible. And everyone is just so like fucking cavalier about it around Blake, especially, I mean, like later when we get to it, they're just kind of like, oh, she was basically tortured to death. And it's like, okay, maybe let's stop talking about this. Yeah. I I wonder like what Rose knew and how she knew it. And if she knew this, because I sort of assumed that Molly was like murdered by some like scary wolf beasts or something, something about the way it was phrased in 1.2 made me think that she was like scratched and bitten to death by animals. They talked about her being eaten, sort of. And this yeah. now sounds like she was like tortured to death by a human. It's not great. No, it's kind of awful, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah, now everyone is kind of just like, oh, yeah, I guess she got like, there were tools and stuff. <laughs> huh. But I guess that's that karma for you. I don't know. But it seems like <laughs> even someone you really hate, that's kind of like, you know, should feel a little bit bad if someone got like it's so horrible it is it is terrible molly didn't do anything to you probably (laughs) i'm hoping we learn more about those four months but we'll see i guess we will anyway i thought it was funny that um laird 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 knows the lawyer because the lawyer is definitely a practitioner and that was funny like the other cop kept being like how do you know these people? And he was like, don't worry about it. Like, it was just like, well, it's good. <laughs> That's true. And the property's worth a lot. No mon- no wonder everyone in this family wants it. Yeah. Um, holy crap. Yeah. It's a lot of money. Also, a thing that I would like to talk about is the fact that Blake needs to sue this lawyer for malpractice. Like, I know it's been like less than 24 hours or whatever since he showed up but i was really expecting the lawyer to be like at the house to be like hi like i know you must be experiencing a lot of trauma right now let's talk through this here's some documents here's a key like let me tell you about things like this is rose you've met rose that was great you know 
he hasn't fucking heard from him even at all. Like, I don't even know how to get in touch with him at this point. And I think it's Dix. And I'd like to hear about it. Or I'd like to hear from him. Also, it seems like in this part, Laird says, like, I'm gonna talk to the lawyer and then go have dinner with you, other Mr. Cop man. And he doesn't mention that later, but he probably did it because the practice or whatever. And I'm just like really freaking curious as to what happened and yeah. why the lawyer didn't fucking show up. He just, ugh. I don't know. It's not, not how you would have done it. Lawyers. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know what my caseload is. Like, I don't know what his caseload is, but no, no, you're no, I would no, Sorry. I think that if your client is murdered, like horrifically, and then like your client 2.0 shows up, you sit at their house and you say hi sorry here's a counselor and some ice cream and some cereal this is why the cereal is around mm, that's why the it's cereal's for grief there. <laughs> so like that's the real thing grandma rose was actually really nice she knew that they were going to need some like really <laughs> cheerful cereal because there was some shit going down so she's like here you go i know some of you are probably lactose intolerant which i get i guess so at least you can pick your milk you know for the cereal you know, you just need some sugar. There you go. <laughs> well, yeah. I feel like if we ever get merch or whatever, we need like cereal merch. I'm down. I mean, I fucking love cereal. Yeah. So I'm down for yeah. that. <laughs> but yeah, so Blake immediately is like, sure, I'm going to leave this house that Molly left and like died because she left. And I'm going to go with this cop and it's all going to be fine, Rose. And Rose is like, literally, what the fuck? <laughs> And the tension between them continues to escalate because Rose feels trapped. She feels powerless. Totally understandable. But Blake is also like, hi, fuck you. Like, I'm the one who has to awaken and I'm the one who has to marry a man. And I'm the one who has to, like, deal with the actual consequences of all of this stuff. I mean, we don't know that Rose doesn't, but yeah. they seem to be talking as though Blake is going to be the one who awakens and has to do all the things in this mm -hmm. chapter. So it makes sense why he's like no yeah it does suck though you can see like both sides like mm -hmm. i mean being basically trapped in like a mirror world and not being able to you know i guess impose your like anything you want really on the outside world without blake helping mm -hmm. um that'd be really frustrating yeah definitely i'm really glad blake left the house because the plot but <laughs> i no, think stupid. he sh shouldn't have but it's also ultimately like Blake should have bodily autonomy at the very least. It sucks that Rose doesn't True. fully, but yeah. And it's like, what happens? Well, I mean, like if something does happen to Blake, what's going to happen to Rose? Right. Ish, you know, because it's kind of like her, his and her bodily autonomy that he's kind of, at least if you look at it in a certain way. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It's hard. It's hard. I'd much rather be Blake in this situation. For sure. But it's do you think you would act like Blake? At the <laughs> no, no. no. I mean, not. yeah, cops are scary. So I might want to go with them because scary, but I hopefully wouldn't. All right. So he basically leaves the house, as you say, um, and they're walking over to this coffee shop. And while they're walking over there, they get into this hypothetical. So let's kind of go through what you think the hypothetical is. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh. I was an international relations major, and so this was sort of fun and nerdy, um, but it's kind of a, not an allegory, like an analogy, a metaphor um, about Jacob's Bell. So we have America, who's the- America. <laughs> Sorry. America, who's the Beheims, Beheims, Be Beams. Well, though, you're probably going to have to help us solve <laughs> We're sorry for not so. asking earlier. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> the, the Try not to make your ears bleed from- <laughs> I don't know. I'll just, just try to get past it. I'll just say Laird's family. <laughs> so we have Laird's family because they're powerful and they're large and they're the keepers of the peace. And they don't like Johannes because Johannes is sus. And so are the Laird's family. So. All right. Um, Hames. Hames. Bames. And then there's Europe, who, which is the blonde coven. The Duchamps. And I'm not sure if they're all a family or if they recruit women into their group and then dye their hair blonde still don't know <laughs> they're like older and they're like 
more prone to grudges and they're set in their ways and beautiful and whatever. Right. So then there's the like problematic description of the small old backwards nation, which is the Aboriginal woman. And then the nature with a couple of settlements is the girl with the rabbit. And then the vibrant country with the inexplicable amount of wealth is Johannes, who lives in the north, who's the reason that Blake shouldn't go north, who has a dog as a familiar. And they think that Johannes is going to like burn out on the excess. And um, Laird seems to say that like, you know, like Blake, if you go down right now, that's going to open up a gap for Johannes to fill. And then we don't want that. Hmm. So we need to take care of him first. Right. Okay. So then continuing on with the metaphor, there's a terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie Holt, the terrorist, who Blake has to ask about. She's a new arrival. She's too small to be a serious threat, and she's self-deluding, and she doesn't understand what she's dealing with, which I definitely can buy that last one, because, like, who freaking does in this universe? That's fair. I'm kind of hopeful that, like, Maggie and Blake will team up as the hated underdogs, but mm -hmm. we will see. And then before we start talking about blake's family in this analogy another thing that i think supports the idea that the siblings or whatever are witch hunters is that they're not in this analogy and they're not questioned um i think blake is kind of or like he, he doesn't ask about them i think that blake at least thinks that they're not a practitioner family in this setting okay because i That's fair. think he would have asked right but so the, the thorburns are a smallish country in south america they're unpredictable, they have a history of aggression, and they have nukes, which I'm assuming are demons. But I thought they were okay. I <laughs> thought you said that they were they're fluff demons, we're right? Get to it. <laughs> um I think Um, I think that the demons are, are nukes and it's okay. And talking about like nukes changing hands is really dangerous, and we just want them to sit there, but then like the talk about radiation, like the nukes spreading, and then like they can't be destroyed. They need to be paved over. Um, so the Thorburns have to like stay intact long enough for Johannes to be dealt with so that then we can get rid of the Thorburns and then not get rid of the nukes, just like bury them. But that there are also like other elements that are contained so long as the nukes are intact. So maybe the like nukes are containing the demons or something. But it also seems okay. like this house... Hillsglade House is in the way of like a massive development, which will like spur their town growing both in the like boring sense and in the like practitioner sense. And America really wants things to be like chill and settled so that they can kind of remain on top in case other dudes yeah. show up for power. I'm sure building like a bunch of new houses on top of a bunch of buried demons is going to be just fine. I mean, like, fuck those right. people or something. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Maybe it, the physical location is not there. Except I think I don't know. I'm really starting to think that the fourth floor has demons. Like the locked the locked floor. Mm. Okay. Is that gonna be one of your predictions for later on? Uh I mean I guess you kinda just said it, but <laughs> Yeah, it's it we're gonna it's gonna play into I'm gonna revisit some of my predictions at the end and kind of talk okay. about updates. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Awesome. I know nothing. <laughs> perfect <laughs> okay yeah so a pretty interesting um comparison uh, like way to go over hypothetical i guess mm -hmm. on all these guys it it was also interesting like blake was like i realized that by doing this he can lie because he's not saying like my family is this and the duchamps are like this he's just saying like mm -hmm. oh europe and i'm wondering how <laughs> he lied you know in this scenario true hmm so basically, after they go through this discussion, they arrive at a coffee shop. Laird ends up drawing a sugar diagram that can turn people away from their table. Blake ends up talking to Rose while Laird's at the counter, just kind of talking about how shady this guy seems. And then after they discuss how shady he seems, they find out that Laird stranded them. <laughs> so they were right. Yeah. 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 People need to stop being dicks about the fact that Molly is like murdered. But we talked yeah. about that already. But he, so Blake is like, I'm going to get coffee. And then he's like, no, I feel sick. Like, I can't drink anything right now because of this talk about my cousin. And I'm curious about, like, we talked about hospitality before when we were talking about the tea with Grandma Rose. And I'm wondering, like, 
would this coffee have been poisoned or would he have like hospitality guest rights or would he have owed Laird something? Like, I feel like the fact mm. that he didn't take coffee was somehow practitionerally significant, but I'm not sure if he like would have been better off or worse off if he had taken it. Okay. I could see that. And I'm also just curious about this town. I want to talk about it a little more a little bit later, but um, I'm interested about the economic status of Jacob's Bell in Pale. Ken it is literally a character, but also like we know a lot even before Ken shows up about like the economic situation of the town. I'm having kind of a hard time like figuring out what Jacob's Bell is like exactly. Like they want to expand, but people are in debt and it's just kind of like, okay, you need like increased property values. You need to sell the house. Hills Glide needs to go away to help mm-hmm. y'all with your property values. But like, uh, it's not just, it's not like Kennet where it's like, nobody lives here except drug addicts or whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure it out. Yeah. So another thing that felt not great to me was Rose is absent. And I'm mm-hmm. not sure if that's her stubbornness or if she was like kind of lost or if she was just like, no, this is really scary and a bad idea and I'm not going. Or if like she was somehow blocked because um, she does show up later and they have that conversation. Mm-hmm. But I just I don't know. I want them to be like a good team. And I was sad that they weren't yeah. working. I mean, did, did Blake have a mirror with him when he was walking? No. How would she have? I don't know. Like, unless here, Laird has a mirror or something, she can't really be right there, right? Well, maybe the watch is, like, super reflective. <laughs> but but in the restaurant, you know, that she's um, she doesn't yeah. show up in the neck and thing until later. I kind of took that to be, like, she didn't want Laird to know that, like, she existed. Mm-hmm. So she didn't really want to, like, she probably didn't know if he could see her or not. So she was like, I'm just gonna kind of hide away until he walks away. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah, that's that's what I took it as, at least. Mm-hmm. Kind of turns out he knew she existed anyway, <laughs> but, you know, she didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm really curious as to how they look in the site. Um, if they look like one, mm. like two people on top of each other or what. That's a good question. Mm-hmm. That would be really interesting. Yeah, so Laird gets out his watch and kind of shows that shows it's a familiar slash implement, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I um, these are mentioned in the familiar text, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't expect that this, these were a thing in Pact. I thought they were just sort of a fun thing he threw in in like the pale text. Um, and I certainly didn't expect it to just be like, hi, here's a familiar implement. Like it's chapter five. Bleh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but it was really exciting. And I, I'm wondering about the personality of this implement. Yeah. I, not to mention if you, I mean, to everyone who read this for the first time with this coming out, we didn't know about the other verse or anything. So like first implement or familiar that we seen except you know. for grandma's cat yeah and like chrono magic is fun we got the augury back but then also like time yay i'm excited it seems like a Pretty neat interesting. yeah aspect of the practice speaking of aspects of the practice i was confused at first when he was like making his diagram pouring the sugar on the table and stuff because it reminded me of nicolette pouring the blood into her diagram in her interlude hmm. Be- like making the the payment part of the physical substance of the diagram the kenneteers don't really do that they just sort of draw things and like bam things work um so being like oh this sugar is an offering and i've established a pattern where i'm going to give them a better offering like really like needing to have the payment up front kind of Mm -hmm. is really interesting uh and makes me wonder about makes me wonder about the kenneteers and like their power more Mm -hmm. but also I mean, it was a really cool way to draw a diagram in a diner uh, yeah. with the coffee cup and stuff. It was great. <laughs> kind of sneaky-ish and looks like he's just being a slob at first. But, <laughs> you know, if he's lo- well-liked, it's like, eh, whatever. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. wonder, like, what happens if you grab Splenda or something instead, like equal. Does that count as, like, a lesser offering? Definitely. I mean, it, it definitely should. <laughs> I'm sorry. You guys, if you guys really like equal or anything, I don't know. Well, it um, reminds me of like diabetics and how I think dad was telling us a story about how he was helping someone who was having like a sugar crash or whatever um, because they hadn't 
eaten enough after their insulin or whatever. And he like yelled at someone to get like a Coke. And they came back with a Diet Coke. And dad just like freaked <laughs> out because he was like, <laughs> you idiot. How dare you? Bring a real Coke if somebody screams it at you, people. <laughs> yeah, Unless bring you a real Coke. Can't, or I guess. Orange juice. Um, I mean, make sure they're awake. If they're mm. not awake, please do not try to shove <laughs> Coke down their throat because they're going to choke. Yep. But there's, yeah, other ways. I'm not going to go into all that right now, but there's there's ways to get by, get past that. But call an ambulance, basically. Yeah, but I think... That should be your first thing. I think most spirits <laughs> would be like, nah. Fuck you. Yeah, like, we need what is this real crap? energy? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it depends on the spirit. Mm. You know? Maybe mm-hmm. some, like, I don't know, like the crappy artificial sweetener you know type of spirits mm-hmm. probably like that at least that, that's my opinion <laughs> some people might really like the taste of that so i'm sorry um i just i just i do, I do not no. anyway <laughs> but yeah that's a pretty interesting comparison i wouldn't have thought of nicolette pouring blood into it but I, yeah that does make sense your next note is about shamanism it looks like yeah i feel like laird says something about how the diagram or something that he drew was like part of shamanism or something and i don't Mm -hmm. know what shamanism is and i feel like i should because charles but charles like makes others and i don't think sugar i don't know i don't know guys i'm this this (laughs) these chapters are like i don't know what's happening it's okay this is complicated okay (laughs) Okay. like yeah this this stuff is complicated yeah it's but i just fine at some point yeah, I'll just talk about it now. I'm I'm confused, y'all. Okay, so it sounds <laughs> like Laird is talking about spirits and others as though they're s- the same or something. But, like, I thought they were different. And I feel like he's kind of saying that they're, like, different types. And if we're thinking about spirits as, like, an analogy for, like, Wild Bo's readers, then sure, some of his readers are really gonna like the spooky stuff. And some of his readers are really gonna like you know the the fun whatever and some of his readers are really gonna like you know i'm trying to think of a character in pale whose name i'm confident i can pronounce and i'm drawing a blank um, <laughs> some people are gonna really love cherry pop or whatever you know like people are gonna like really have different preferences mm-hmm. and so it would make sense that some of the spirits would be like down with certain things and not as down with other things but i am confused i think it is kind of both at least so isn't like edith like girl by candlelight like a complex spirit yes but then like edith doesn't decide like edith doesn't serve on a jury as far as i know like every six months to determine if some random practitioner is like forsworn right but if like you're forsworn and nobody calls it out the 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 spirits will decide and like tell you Mm -hmm. and like i was pretty sure that like if lucy draws a diagram um, and then something happens. It's not that she made that thing happen in as much as it is the spirits who saw her draw the diagram, interpreted what she wanted and was like, yeah, you're cool enough that we will do this thing in the way that yeah. you have requested us to do this thing. Um, mm-hmm. And it doesn't seem like that's Edith's job. <laughs> and I don't know what's I mean, that's happening, fair. y'all. That's fair. That's <laughs> uh. all right. We'll keep we'll keep that in the back of our minds. I'll figure it out, we'll, maybe. <laughs> I should have read Pale slower. I'm learning this. I like skip it's over hard descriptions to read it slow. and stuff. It's, yeah, it's all right. You can always go back over. People can give us clarification because people are nice, or we could just reread stuff. It'll be fine. You know. Mm-hmm. I have a fun, like, kind of ridiculous mini prediction here. Um, <laughs> okay. So, Laird says that Grandma was like really fucking badass. And that part of that was that she was helped by a generous heaping of time. And so, like, thought one was, like, wait, was Grandma heartless? Like, because part of what heartless practitioners do, from what I understand, is try to keep themselves, like, young. And I was like, maybe she did some of that. But then also, (laughs) I feel like Laird and Grandma kind of vibe. And I guess Grandma's older than Laird, so this is already not really working. But maybe Grandma and Laird were, like, a thing, and they, like, dated, and he, like, helped her with some of the to chrono time stuff and i don't know i like loki ship them based on i love almost it. nothing <laughs> that's amazing okay uh so so are you saying that you think that she is heartless or is she like kind of like a dual type because you're still like for the law right i don't we don't know about the demons I yet. Don't know. they might just be part of the they just happen to be there 
She just wrote some books, you know? Yeah, I feel like <laughs> if Grandma was heartless, I mean, maybe she was heartless and then she was like, my family's going to catch on that I'm not dying. And then she like accepted that it was her time and got tired and was like, yeah, I'm just going to die now or whatever. But uh, I'm not, I'm not saying that definitely for sure. I just thinking like, how else did she have a whole bunch of time? I mean, there are, there are different things about different practices that you don't know though. Right. Cause just like the chronomancy, you know, we found out that's a practice like today. <laughs> <laughs> we can go into this more at the end if you want, but like, you're going to have to clarify if you still think she's a law mage or into demons or heartless or just all of them, or none of them, you know, just think on that. We'll come back. Okay. We're going to come back to it. Okay. Because <laughs> I feel like that's switching up, like, what kind of practice she, or she is quite a, you know, quite a bit. <laughs> we'll come back to it. All right. So later, just kind of talking to him about, like, you know, why Blake should just kind of, like, give up, I guess, all the all the family nukes or whatever it is. <laughs> And basically it's like, guns are more dangerous when in the hands of someone who doesn't know how to use them. Yeah, it reminds me of the Kenneteers and all the ways they could, like, seriously hurt themselves or other people, especially with, like, the incredible amount of power they had access to combined with no one wanting to teach them anything. And I just thought it was really powerful and an idea that, like, knowledge can be... Or like, like not really knowing everything that's going on, but having kind of a lot of power and like jumping into a situation like it can really hurt you um, and other people a lot. Mm -hmm. And it, it reminded me of um, Marie Chica. I know that her name is not something I pronounce very well. I always said Marisica, but yeah, I think it's I don't know. I will say <laughs> who knows Mari. Um, it reminded me of Mari because like the, uh, Laird says like an attacker can take your gun from you which is part of how it could be dangerous if you don't know what you're doing and i was like ha, ha 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 in the same way that like mari controls like can control a lot of the glamour and stuff and like other fairy can control um the glamour that verona uses constantly and stuff it was funny to think like that was a really that was a solid example of how them not knowing how to use glamour like turned back and kind of slapped them in the face yeah that's very true mm -hmm. so laird couldn't get a police dog and i don't know why i mean this obviously has to do with the fact that like as a familiar i mean this has to do with the fact that like grandma was like don't get a dog or a rat and i thought that was just like a their family thing but this seems like a jacob's bell thing except johannes has a dog and like it seems like laird made this decision about his familiar before johannes was in the picture so it wasn't like laird was like oh i can't have a dog as a familiar because like only one person in the town can at a time I mean, do you think it's a Jacob's Bell, th Bell thing, or do you think it's, like, a weird practice thing we don't know about? I think it's a Jacob's Bell thing. Okay. I mean, I guess I haven't seen any dog familiars or rat familiars that I can think of. But, uh, yeah, specifically, it's like, do not allow your familiar to take the form of a rat or dog. Right. Which is kind of, which is interesting, because even if Johannes has, like, a, who, who knows what his familiar it is, right? But it sure doesn't care about that rule. <laughs> right. And, well, that's the thing. I'm thinking that... If it was something to do with the practice, I think that, like, Grandma wouldn't even have to say it. And that the familiar, unless they, like, fucking hated Blake or whatever, would probably be like, hey, no, I can't do that. Or, like, that's a bad idea or something. Okay. So I think it has something to do with this community. Maybe some, like, agreement they all made at some point. Huh. Okay. In the same way that, like, Patrick, like, isn't supposed to make deals or whatever while he's in Jago's Bell or something. I don't know. All right. Maybe we'll find out. Or maybe it'll just be, like, maybe that's another reason why these people suck because they hate dogs. <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe you'll find out johannes is like the actual like best guy because he has a dog it could be true i don't know i feel like you're too suspicious of him to be come to that conclusion though <laughs> <laughs> i just like that i was sort of like hey, hey johannes is in the north end and then they were like yep and i was like lol <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's hilarious all right so basically yeah rose talks to blake um, and then Blake gets up to go talk to Laird and finds out, oh, like four or five hours have passed and I've just apparently been sitting here the whole time and didn't realize it. And Laird's gone. So that was kind of a dick move. Mm -hmm. I was thinking a lot about Laird's wording 
at the beginning of this whole interaction and how mm-hmm. I wouldn't I, I feel like I kind of would have thought that it was pretty safe and stuff in the way that Blake kind of trusted him. But then I also started to think about lying in this universe and how it's it's physically possible for Laird to have lied, right? True. So and I'm going to talk about a legal concept because it's fun. So in the legal realm, there's subjective tests and objective tests, right? Okay. So in The Wheel of Time... Very minor-ish spoiler alert for the Wheel of Time and Aes Sedai. Aes Sedai are the magic people, uh, the female magic people, and they can't, they physically cannot say something that they believe is a lie or that they don't believe is true. So it's like mm. in Liar Liar, right? When Jim Carrey can't say, like, the sky is red or whatever, they physically cannot. Mm-hmm. And so that would be a subjective test because it's about what you personally believe, right? Whereas okay. the other verse is an objective lying system where if Verona says, like, it's going to rain tomorrow because she saw the news forecast and it's going to rain tomorrow, but then it doesn't rain tomorrow. Like in this universe, she has lied, even though what she believed, like she didn't say something she didn't believe to be true. Um, and so that's an objective mm-hmm, test. Mm-hmm. Um, like, it doesn't matter what you sub- like thought in your mind. It just matters like. Like, it's more of an external thing. And I think it's a really interesting loophole that maybe no one... Not a loophole, but it's an, it's an interesting thing that I don't think anyone will necessarily exploit. But, like, someone in this universe could lie and then face, like, extreme consequences for it. I mean, people make small lies all the time and kind of it suffer, It makes their practice suffer. Like, I think Verona or Lucy or someone wasn't being completely careful um, in the earlier chapters of Pale... And I just wonder, mm-hmm. like, is there a scenario with, where lying would be worth it? Um, not breaking a promise, because from what I understand, you're only forsworn if a promise is broken, whereas yeah. gainsaying is, like, more temporary. Yeah. The loss of power for yeah. temporary, yeah. And I wonder if, like, that will ever happen in these stories, or if it'll ever be worth it, because it's really interesting, but it also, like, might really fuck up your reader <laughs> emotionally. I mean welcome <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> but true that's an interesting thought there so it's like he, he could just decide that it's worth this temporary loss of power to lie and fuck this guy over mm-hmm. like i don't think he did in this situation but i'm wondering if there will ever be that calculation made by someone hmm. that's a good question well basically blake is trying to leave trying to head home runs into Patrick and his companions, Eve and Keller. He gets super creeped out, to say the least. Uh, probably not the best way to describe it, to be honest, but <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Rose ends up showing up and saves the day by doing a bunch of BS, like, BSing, essentially. Yep. Before he runs into Patrick and company, it seems like he was going in a certain direction and he sees a man, like, bundled up staring at him. And then he sort of turns and, like, runs into these other, like, these fairy. And I'm just like, who is that? And did I not understand? Because I tried to read it, like, four times. I mean, could just be another random creepy other. Yeah. It's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. That's sort of what I assumed. But yeah, okay, so this is, like, my first... Well, okay, Blake's not gay. But other than that, this is, like, my first real big wrong prediction. Um, Patrick is not a <laughs> practitioner. He is another... <laughs> um this is what happens when i don't read slowly because i did not or blake in this chapter is like oh the one with the face that was all stretched out and i was like what are you talking about and i went back and read the dream and it was like his smile was too wide and i was like okay (laughs) i guess i should have realized it was funny that he was like oh they like he smells like a rose because i was like haha the flowers that blake was smelling in grandma's study or whatever were definitely roses now that I've said grandma's study out loud, where is that room in the house? Why have we gone back there? Anyway, um, I don't know what court or courts these fairies are from. They don't necessarily seem winter. Uh, they've also been like exiled. I think they're from different courts, but I can't okay. really tell. Also, like Patrick's a prince and like that's exciting and confusing. I'm thinking maybe like high summer and I don't know why. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know who else has princes. I kind of... Keller's really scary. I wonder if he's, like, Dark Summer. Um, But I don't know if he's, like, monstrous enough. 
and then mm-hmm. Eve or whatever her name was. Uh, yeah, I think her name was Eve at least. That's what I wrote down. So I'm just sort of assuming Hopefully they're all right. going to be like not high summer and dark fall because we get that impale. But I should probably stop making those assumptions. <laughs> I mean, those are always fun to listen to anyway, even if they're totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe Ev. Maybe her name is Ev. Ev. Maybe they just said Evie. I thought that Ev was the creepiest. Yeah. To be honest to me. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I mean, they're all pretty scary. creepy in different ways. I don't, so. I was kind of like, yeah, Patrick, what's up? Like, <laughs> Okay. You're, he, you didn't really get too bad of a vibe from him. You're kind of like, this guy's all right. Or Yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Cool. I like it. I don't know, y'all. Okay. Basically, his friends were like the creepy, the creepy ones, and he's just like the hey bro. I mean he wasn't like completely and totally fine. I definitely wasn't like, yes, you should trust him, but I just I don't know. I, I was like, yeah, cool. It's kind of interesting how they were talking about him as like a rose the whole time. Um mm-hmm. saying like, oh, like we're your thorns, you're defenseless. Mm-hmm. Like, I think Patrick says at one point, this rose has no eyes, which is only natural, but it's usually sharper. It has been cast away, denuded. So Blake was sort of cast away from his family. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if the not having eyes is like not being a woke end. But I don't know if Grandma Rose, like is it? it's only natural because he can tell that they're not awake or is it only natural because none of the thorburns have open eyes in which case like what but i I think it's probably the awaken thing and yeah he doesn't have any demons on him or whatever (laughs) so he doesn't have thorns he mean he can't practice so maybe that's part of it but he seems pretty dang aware at this point so i don't know that he has a lot of innocence protection left yeah i also thought it was interesting that like i don't remember one of them i think thinks like confuses him for a girl or something or thinks like oh he's oh he's not a girl it's a boy and then he was like no one's thought that about me since i was five and i was like isn't five a little bit old to be confused for a girl i mean maybe he had long hair i don't know maybe and his parents also i bet you know like they wanted a girl so maybe they weren't as concerned with like because some parents get like weird and offended when like there's like a tiny little bald baby and people don't immediately know or whatever because gender roles. But I just I feel like five is kind of old and I'm wondering it just feels like more like Blake Rose connection something. True. That's kind of what I thought, too. Yeah, pretty sure he looks like a dude mm-hmm. like to most normal people. But they're like, huh, guess he is a, a guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. Then Rose finally comes in and saves the day. Dun, 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 dun. Does some really impressive, like, winging it. <laughs> yeah, I was really happy that she showed up and she saved Blake, who violently reacts to someone trying to touch him, which I we really got to get that story soon <laughs> or that explanation. But yeah, I was like, she knows their names and otherwise it's just sort of like, I'm going to talk fancy about deals and crap and even like, Seems to avoid a trap by being like, we're not going to agree to that or something, but we'll like agree to maybe think about doing something later, which was like good enough, which was great. And then maybe the most exciting part was that Patrick can get into the mirror and that freaked Rose out. But I think maybe was like, I hope was maybe hopeful um, and not just like scary and intimidating because I guess that was Patrick showing like, I can fuck with you too. But I'm hoping that Rose is like, oh, maybe I can get out. Um, that's kind of what I took from it. And I'm only now realizing like how fucking scary that would be. <laughs> yeah, no, that was that was pretty interesting. <laughs> that's for sure. So I guess like, yeah, what did you think of these fairy compared to the other ones that we've seen in Pale? Yeah, so Guillaume and Mari reminded me of them in that they're they're like living in a small town in the middle of nowhere and like these dudes are like exiled and living in a smallish town so that's both fairly similar but these people seem more like vagrants or something like more like down on their luck like aggressive 
kind of antagonistic. Whereas um, the Kennet ones, like Mari is like there to have fun and fuck with people, but not like she feels a little less of a threat. This feels really dumb to say about a fairy, um, <laughs> but Guillaume or Guillaume or whatever it is. Big G. Big G is like Big G. <laughs> totally just seems like very on the up and up and like very like happy and supportive of his like little buddies that he's real proud of and loves hanging with John and it's just like trying to like make peace with his life kind of um whereas these dudes do not seem to have peace with much of anything so these ones seem I mean do you think that's just kind of like because we're in Blake's head and so these guys seem scarier or do you think like these actually are more threatening or no I I I think that they're definitely more threatening i don't know if they have as much power as the kennet fairy do because they are like exiled so like i'm not sure if they have like the potential to be a threat if like big g and mari like you know turn on them but big g big g (laughs) hilarious um okay no interesting so basically after they get through that um laird shows up like right around the corner from Blake's house so that he technically can walk him back um, because he's a butt face. Yeah, he basically goes through all the ways that he didn't, you know, technically lie or anything. So he's all right. Ends up walking Blake home and then Blake angrily reads all night. (laughs) Yeah, Blake got a good lesson in um, the importance of precise wording. And again, I was suspicious of Laird and whatever and like Blake was too but it was still really hard to figure out what was going on and a lot of the things he said were kind of odd and hard to interpret but then he thinks again about Paige and like why isn't Paige in this position she loves arguing about semantics and I'm like why isn't Paige in this position I'm glad it keeps coming up because that means we're gonna get an answer that's true (laughs) at least probably you know (laughs) there has to be an answer I know it does seem like she would be really good for this kind of aspect of it right i mean yes i'm worried she'd get cocky or do something uh impulsive or something like that but she does seem to like this sort of thing that's fair yeah i thought it was interesting that laird like it's funny because like everybody seems to know about rose and about the deals with other people like laird knows about the deal not deal with patrick or whatever And I'm like, is this like a sight thing? Like, is he seeing connections or like, did his implement somehow tell him? Just excited to figure out what's going on. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then going back to me not understanding the practice. (laughs) (laughs) He, he, Blake is asking Laird about the fairy and he's like, they're fairy, right? Like blah, blah, blah. And Laird's like, don't put them in boxes, Blake. Like they're just people. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, like, (laughs) No, like they're fairy, like they're not goblins, like they're, and even goblins are goblins, you know. And like, hail is about, it's a, I mean, wild bow stories in general are a lot about like the fact that things are more complicated than they seem, and that categories and boxes and things don't always work and can sometimes be harmful. But like, we're five chapters in, and <laughs> I'm not ready for this. No. And <laughs> they're fairy, and they have courts, and they have boxes. So the thing is, though, like, he was like, once upon a time, they would have fallen under that label. So when they were in those courts, right, they've been exiled. And if they've been exiled for a really long time, because I mean, if you remember some of the stuff in Pale, like um, some of the chapters where they were talking about, like, kidnapping children and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And some of those, like, I think, like, glamour drowned and stuff um, could end up like turning into fae but if i'm remembering correctly and so Hmm. like people can like they can change you know like they were human were aware and then turned into another um so if an innocent can turn into another um why can't another turn into another type of other you know Hmm. so i think that he was just like you know technically because he can't lie so he can't just be like oh they're still fairy (laughs) um Hmm. so he's like technically they're not really under that label anymore so you can't really just call them fairy because you might be gainsayed you know Mm -hmm. um so kind of have to say that 
I guess what their description is, which here he says, men and women who are desperate to entertain themselves over the course of a very long, long time. Mm -hmm. So it's like they were Fae, but have been exiled for so long, they can't really be called that anymore without possibly being gainsaid. That's kind of my read on it. Well, it also kind of makes me think about like the Winter Court and how they need to entertain themselves to prevent falling into winter, maybe true but that to me suggests that they're still fairy (laughs) true i know it's like well maybe if they weren't exiled then they'd be going to winter instead Hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe they can't go to winter because they got kicked out of all the courts i don't know speculating yeah all right so that was our chapter basically that we went through um malia said that she's going to go through some Possibly new predictions and some updates on some old predictions, which I think we're all looking forward to. So, yeah. So I'm not sure how these will count in terms of my score at the end of this podcast, but I thought I'd talk about how these things are evolving because that could be interesting. So one of the things I was thinking about are like the bird and antler others that we saw in um, 1.2. So I think they're not specifically necessarily energy draining. I think that they're anti-technology that being around them makes technology stop functioning. So it's not that they're like sucking energy out of things. It's that they're like, uh, like they are an anachronism and they're drawing technology into their era where it doesn't work or something. I think they're like anti-technomancy ish others. Okay. And so with that as a thought, I really don't think America sent them. I think that my prediction in 1.2 was wrong by America. I mean, Laird's family. And I'm kind of thinking maybe the girl with the rabbit, like the the nature wild, whatever. Yeah. So there, there's that. And then, okay. So grandma's fractious is the fun through line in this podcast so far. And this week in my D&D game, one of my fellow players who doesn't, hasn't read the story, um, he said, anyone who makes packs with demons is kind of a dick. And it just like hit me like in the brain i was like hmm that's that's sort of true um (laughs) that's sort of true and so maybe like messing with demons does hurt your karma but like here are my problems with that problem number one kevin is an asshole kevin like kevin's whole thing is like from pale i glare at you kevin and pale i glare at you and you get bad karma and you're fucked right um and there's like no repercussions for this um, other than maybe his girlfriend will murder him. But he had to use his eye like 18 jillion times on her, right? For that to happen. And like Bristow and how Bristow like manipulates everything. And like if the spirits can see everything, like can't they see that Bristow's just like being a dick and using like the formalist system to get out of repercussions? I mean, maybe Verona is his karma. <laughs> But yeah, then the other thing is, like, Grandma's not dumb, right? So if if demons are making their karma worse, and she doesn't want their karma to be worse, then why continue to do demon practice if demon practice is bad for your karma? And so I guess, my best guess is that, like, the demons are nukes, right? And somebody has to take care of them, and their family's already in this, and Grandma's like, well, if we're already in this, I'm going to do the best freaking job I can, Okay. Um, I don't think she necessarily got the family into the demon practice because, again, I don't think she's that dumb if demons fuck up your karma. Because I don't mm-hmm. think she, I don't think grandma started the karma fuck up. I think that she inherited it. Okay. So this leads to my, like, kind of sad prediction that grandma's not a karmic law practitioner and that she focuses on, like, demons, which probably aren't karmic law. Um, But... I think that the lawyer is the karmic practitioner or <laughs> the karmic law practitioner. Cause I think that grandma needs a karmic law practitioner to help her deal with this shit. I think that the lawyer is supposed to sign off on all the stuff that they do, mm-hmm. um, like the big rituals and stuff. And I think part of that might have something to do with him knowing about karmic law. Cause somebody has got to please wild bow. If okay. Wild bow. <laughs> if karmic law is not a thing in this story can you please just write me a little treatise on what karmic law practices please like please <laughs> <laughs> i mean this i'm so curious okay that is all <laughs> so just to just to clarify do you think grandma 
because you mentioned earlier like that she, she like something about heartless do you think she's a heartless practitioner or you're just or like she maybe was using some aspects of that practice or like yeah i mean i think she was buying time somehow but i i don't think that she was doing it i mean it's okay it seems like if demon people have bad karma that heartless people should get bad karma right because heartless people are like i'm gonna steal your youth and the spirits are like fucking great and <laughs> grandma's like i'm gonna draw a pentagram and mean it and the spirits are like how dare you like i just <laughs> i can't <laughs> i can't um uh, but i so i don't think she's a heartless maybe use some sort of heartless aspects to something but no okay. yeah uh, just random food for thought just for one of your problems you're saying like <laughs> you know adding like why would she choose uh this if she's trying to like get better karma and stuff um i mean with bad car like karma and stuff that kind of has to do with like if the spirits to do what you want right so it's like if you're trying to practice and you already have like incredibly incredibly <sighs> terrible karma how are you gonna practice if the spirits aren't going to do anything that you want, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Nobody should be a demon practitioner. It's stupid. <laughs> They're going to eat you. It's Faust. Okay. Yeah. Um. What kind of practitioner are you saying Grandma Rose is now? Because you said heartless, but you're talking about demons. So. Yeah, I don't really think she's a heartless she's like a she's like the satan <laughs> she's the satan <laughs> yeah she would buy lil nas x's shoes i don't know if y'all know about that lil nas x has a new devil themed music video and he's selling shoes that have like real drops of human blood in them <laughs> as part of this thing it's a lot y'all <laughs> whose blood is it did he get his blood i don't know <laughs> You steal a bag from a blood bank? Maybe. That's jacked up because people need blood. <laughs> yeah, probably not. I don't know. Maybe not that one. It's a lot. Anyway, I don't know. I, I hope. Why? Um, I don't know. I, I can bleed on your own shoes. <laughs> I mean, it's like, what? This is... <laughs> I'm so confused. I think you can bleed on your own shoes would be a good episode title. <laughs> I mean, fair. <sighs> but you think grandma would be okay with those shoes? <laughs> I mean, you I think, think grandma would be making her own pair like, <laughs> oh, yeah, let's get some bloody shoes in this mess. That's going to help me with. I mean, she probably. See, well, I I think that grandma made the shoes that inspired these shoes, but better. Like, I think that, you know, those like Christian, de whatever, like the, the high heels with like, like the red on the back um yeah I, that are like yeah like expensive and stuff i think that grandma made some of those with like real human blood or ooh, what if she made like the heels light up and like <laughs> look like little flames and then it'd be like little demon hellfire shoes cool. with blood on them right that was totally I mean, worth all the negative karma that it took to oh yeah like so much negative karma that's that's what she was she was like well i made some some enemies sorry guys she 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 didn't really mention like i also added some bad karma because i had some kick-ass looking shoes um maybe that that could be an implement you know some <gasps> demon hellfire shoes that light up yeah they never run out of battery power yeah because they run off the light that like i don't know now i just have this whole like the devil wears prada thing like yeah <laughs> oh my gosh like her <sighs> her shoes are the implement that allow her to ascend the 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 ladder to to greatness can you imagine like if like blake had to have those as a hand me down and we use those like not only he has to m marry a man and he's straight <laughs> but he also has to wear these really awesome like light up heels yeah it's a, mean. it's like an honor really it's, um. It really is. You should just, I mean, just embrace it. You're Rose. I mean, you know, like, it'll be fine. <laughs> all right. So now that we're done with all that, basically going to see how, uh, Malia, you think 
this these two chapters compared to pale did you see any comparisons that you want to make or um anything that you were thinking of or yeah the so the thing that i'm trying to figure out is um what kind of town is jacob's bell and i was thinking about it in comparison to kennett like we were talking about earlier kennett is really um not doing well economically and so i was like okay there's a it's a franchise not like a cute little coffee shop and like maybe that means that jacob's bell isn't doing as well because i sort of associate franchises with like like run down mcdonald's sorts of things as opposed to like cute local coffee shops are all like happy and nice and their drinks are a little more expensive but like you're happy whereas you go to the franchise like for predictability but also for like cost effectiveness maybe but it doesn't seem like Kennet, where it's like oh it's all the drug dealers and the snowboarders and the whatever um and like none of these shops are open lol i so i'm trying to figure that out and that those were an interesting vibe but then the other thing that really struck me was how populated jacob's bell is particularly with practitioners like we didn't see another practitioner for a long time in pale Mm -hmm. and it makes sense to me why elliot was apparently like freaking out about secret hidden practitioners all the time because like they're everywhere like these people in this town (laughs) like (laughs) they're all practitioners it feels like whereas in kennett it was much more isolated as far as we know there are no secret practitioners in kennett yeah that's that's fair and so they basically have free reign to do whatever they want whereas like Jacob's Bell is really full and there's like camps and people are like watching each other and like you run into people walking down the street I feel like the Kenneteers never run into people walking down the street like they saw Pam that one time yeah um but here it's just like ah, oh, there's all these people and I don't know it's it's a different vibe that's that's a good point all right um on to last week's discussion question out of all the books in Grandma Rose's library, which one would catch your eye and why? So we got some pretty good responses. Um, we'll start with Bavarian Barbarian, which is a fantastic name, by the way. They said they enjoyed uh, the sounds of jokes from the fairy folk. Basically, were like, that can't be too bad, right? They're just jokes. You know, what's so bad about that? Otherwise, if they had to choose something else, they'd go for Blessed Wrongs. And they said they would hope it's just blurst images in text form. Which, fair enough. I don't really love looking at blurred images, but could be catchy to some people, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Menalon agreed that Blessed Wrongs sounded intriguing. They thought that it's catchy, it seems contradictory, um, and they thought based on Pale, it, maybe it's talking about others like Tashlet and her family. They also liked the sound of Lilith's children, thought it could also be a similar vibe but maybe Blessed Wrongs was like the OG curse and Lilith's children are like, and then what happens to your descendants kind of a thing. All right. um, Hero of Old Iron says, basically said that none of the texts seem very interesting (laughs) to them. They basically said if there were any books on like magic blacksmithing, that would be kind of ideal, which that does sound pretty cool. Yeah. To be honest. (laughs) Yeah. The Bee Vampire. So they'd flip through on other seditions and that, They'd like to read pitiable colon transcriptions from informal dialogues with vampire, uh, mostly because the word pitiable is really kind of like intriguing. Like, what does that mean? Tag guide. I said that really weird. I'm sorry. Tag guide. Tag it. <laughs> they picked quite a few books. I think they picked five. I'm just going to go over their three. So their number one pick was Wu Zen, Eastern Bodin Practices. It's basically an Afro- Caribbean religion in China. We you know what's not to like about that. That sounds kind of amazing. Um, that's what they were saying. And second and third picks are Lilith's children and classifying others, fiends and darker beings. Yeah, Violet Faith thought that glimmers and gasps and dryads and classifying others all sounded neat. Yeah, I kind of I, I feel like glimmers and gasps sounds kind of cool to me too. It's I don't a even great know title. Why. It's a great title. And then we've got Captain Rhino. Basically said if. They were Blake. Um, they'd pick Dramatis Personae just because they know the locals and get to figure out who doesn't like them, <laughs> which is a pretty pretty good logic to that, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, if it was just them choosing Poppets. Poppets. Just because they're like, I don't know why. Poppets. But it just sounds kind of cool. <laughs> don't know anything about it. 
And then finally, Clawford said that they would pick the Dreode book. Sorry to all our assumedly Gaelic, Gaelic listeners out there. They said they'd pick it based solely on the inset decoration. It's more decorated, so it feels more important. So Clawford judges books by their covers, but don't we all? <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to lie. That's how I picked most of my books just growing <laughs> up. If it didn't have a good cover, I'm sorry. Yeah. Like, had to have good font. Mm. Which is kind of stupid, but you know what? It actually kind of worked well. Fonts are important. Either that or all the books. Either that or I would have just liked them all anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? We'll move on to our discussion question. So, explain karma and how others work to Malia because she still doesn't get it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Malia wrote that, so don't get mad at me. Um, no, Malia's actually doing pretty good on all that. Um, serious discussion question. Using Laird's hypothetical world politics metaphor, describe Kennet. You can also include the Blue Heron Institute if you'd like. Um, I like that hypothetical world politics metaphor. Yeah, I'm really curious to see what y'all come up with. Um, I, we don't, or I don't want to give too many like examples or whatever because I really am curious to see how like totally how you structure it like get creative I'm really um stoked yeah for this discussion question yeah I mean and if you guys like I don't know if you'd rather use like states or I don't know whatever is you're more familiar with as opposed to like actual continents or countries or whatever that's fine Mm -hmm. but yeah just let us know what you think from that because I'm kind of curious what what you guys are gonna say Anyway, thanks for listening, guys. If you enjoyed this episode, you'd like to help support the podcast, please subscribe, share it with your friends, and leave a rating and review. If you'd like to support Wild Bo as he continues to write fantastic stories, go to patreon.com slash You can follow the pod on Twitter at Pale Comparison, or send us an email at paleincomparisonpod at gmail.com. Keep an eye out for our Pale in Comparison Reddit thread. Fun fact, the first vacuum cleaners were so large that they were horse-drawn and couldn't fit indoors. Bye! Bye!